Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Leo Madden. I'm now the new chair of the Government's Audit and Standards Committee. It's a very short-lived chairmanship, as several people here <laughs> will note. There are three former chairs in, on the panel. <laughs> Only one of them Ian's here today. So I suppose I may have well last to May. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'll do my very best. <laughs> <laughs> there's just the usual housekeeping, which is that if there's the uh, continuous fire alarm sounds, ecu evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairs. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble a Queen Victoria statue in front of the civic offices. Uh, to comply with the Portsmouth Cultural Trust Fire Marshal regulations, if you sign into the Guild Hall, which nobody has, remember to sign out. And can I t remind you that we have live web streaming today. We have no deputation, so um, I don't have to read all that out, okay? So what we've got, we've got apologies from councillors John Ferret and Simon Bosch. Simon only phoned in this morning, I believe, yeah, on that. And as I say, we have no deputations. Okay, thank you. This, well, we're dealing with people here. This is an audit. This is our major audit committee. Should not the chief finance officer be here? He was absent the last one. He is not here today. Uh, thank you, Chair. The um, uh, the director of finance uh, has asked me to attend in his stead as section 151 officer. To, sorry, to be, to be fair, can, well, can we have, well, have yeah, a, yeah. an explanation of why this should be the great. case? Because this is the Governor's Audit and Standards Committee of the City Council. And I think we have a. Um, it is right that the person who has overall responsibility for finance in the City Council should be here, especially since there are uh, matters uh, here such as the Treasury Management Mid Year Review and the. Um, and propose changes to the constitution, things of the sort, he, uh, we feel he should be here for it. Okay, well, I'll undertake to have a, a, a word with him, okay, and, and uh, for future meetings, okay. Thank you. Shall we do the agenda? So we don't apologies. Any declarations of interest? Okay, good. Um, the minister of the meeting of 14th September. I think, I think, wait a minute, I'll get mine. I, 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 that's right. <laughs> well, I was going to do accuracy and matters arise, and that's okay. Or would you rather, we could, we could do accuracy first if you want, and then matters arising. What would you prefer? Oh, it's up to yourselves. If, if you don't mind, um, accuracy, although I have to commend... Um, uh, Vicky Pletas for having done a very good job of uh, encapsulating what was an extremely long and I should imagine for her very tedious meeting um, although it's jolly exciting for me um, uh, there is one point about MMD here where it's, it, it suggested that it was up to the councillors concerned to um, make their submissions prior to a meeting. I don't recall it having been that way around, but of course one's recollection of a meeting is not the same as somebody else's. Um, I had understood, and I'm um, having looked at the follow-up that's come with a rather terse comment saying, uh, if I can actually quote it, but it's so brief, I don't think it's going to, going to take too much time for the members, if, if I can find the blooming thing. Uh, it says something to the point, oh yes, <coughs> members' concerns and observations will be recorded, but this is not a matter for this committee to decide. It may be possible for individual members to bring the matter to the attention of, of Cabinet for them to make a decision. This is not about deciding what to do about MMD. It is to assess how the officers, which is what our job is, have dealt with the MMD issue since inception and whether or not it could have been done differently and how we would recommend, as a result, it should go forward in terms both of disclosure, which I think is um, certainly not adequate, uh, in terms of understanding what it is that the Council has agreed to do and what it is continuing to agree to do, usually at the last minute, and whether or not we should be able to hold those officers to account who've simply treated it as a kind of 
an embarrassment that, that the councillors have simply got to go red over. Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, I don't, I, I'm obviously scared it over that bit because I didn't, I didn't read it. It was up to members to organise a meeting, I have to say. But, but um, w when we had the pre-meeting, um, we decided that you know, such a meeting should take place. Clearly we need the port manager there and, and whoever, who's in charge of the finance, Julian? Uh, it would be port yeah. On, yeah. On yeah. Sorry. sorry, is the port manager that's on the board for, for MMD and it would be the port manager who would therefore come and respond? So of course is the section 151 officer. He is a director of MMD and I think taking Councillor Mason's point a little further it would be bizarre, to say the least, if he were not in attendance at a meeting where we were discussing what had happened over the last nine or ten years in MMD. Well, sir, quite happy to have a briefing on it, and I can't, I can't force people to turn up, but, but certainly I think the port manager should be there anyway, which is what we said at the, when we discussed it. And, and I think the best thing, it was supposed to happen in October, I see. Um, there was this meeting. <laughs> Probably because of this hiatus and, and the changeover or whatever, but, but, but we've come up with some dates. Yep. Yeah? Yep. Is that okay? And, and ho hopefully this month sometime, yeah? We organise that, that any actions arising from this meeting uh, and any papers that are due to be circulated to us on request are available within two weeks of the meeting having taken place. Chairman, the, the difficulty we had this time was that the port manager was on leave and then Mr Ward was on leave as well, so that was why we weren't really able to organise it during October, but we will find a date as soon as possible. And you would like the meeting during November, the Chairman's indicated that, and I'll work to that end. Well, I, could I say, I don't know the limitations there, because clearly some people here work, and therefore, you know, are constrained by when they're available. So I don't know, could, could members tell me what days are best for them, and hopefully um, we'll, all, we'll all be able to do a particular... Fridays work for me, usually. Fridays work for, uh, yeah. Fridays work for um, me very well. Um, Fridays work for but, me. But, but I, I, I want to take the point slightly beyond the MMD issue that any papers that are that we are informed at the meeting will be available to us as supplementary to the papers we already have will be available within two weeks of the meeting having taken place. So, for example, this pack of, of uh, information that, that has come rising from you know, various points that were, were made at the last meeting when we were told we would get briefing notes from them, haven't, weren't available to me, certainly by the time of the last ca full council meeting. Yep. And I would ask that a, a direct result of having this meeting is that we have action points and any papers that we've requested that are requested from outside this meeting are available to us within two weeks of the meeting, simply so that we don't lose track of it, because otherwise I would have issued questions to Mr Pike. Could, could I just, from a practical point of view, um, Mrs Plattis obviously prepares the minutes and they have to be agreed, and that obviously will then eat into those two weeks, um, and the actions don't arise until the minutes have been agreed. Can I suggest we have three weeks? That, that would be a hunky-dory for me. We're happy with that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 I think the problem I find, which, which is, and happily it's not on this term, the, the performance, manage, performance management report or whatever, is that it's always in arrears anyway. And I think we did ask in the past that could we, that's fine, and those reports will go wherever they go as well as here. But I've asked in advance, you know, could we have an update on any of the aspects of it a, a, a week beforehand so that at least we're not asking questions and then the whole thing goes back and back and back. So um, hopefully that will be done, Michael. I mean, I think, you know, because uh, that's, the, that's the big report, isn't it, the quarterly one, really, that we're looking at. And that's what most of the questions arise from. So I, I'm ha I would like, when we get this, which will be the next meeting, I think, anyway, that if, you know, we'll have the report, it will have been done, gone to various boards or whatever, uh, but, but for us, a week before, if there's anything, any update on anything, that would be useful. Chairman, equally as well, if it is possible that when members receive the reports, if they have particular concerns, if they can raise them in advance of the meeting, uh, it'll save a lot of time in the meeting, and we may actually be able to come along and answer the questions. 
which I'm sure would be okay. of assistance. In, a, in, in response to that, it would be useful if those reports were put in a PDF form that we can read electronically and that, uh, that therefore allow Absolutely us... Absolutely not a problem. I Perfect. will ensure that they're all available in PDF. So on that basis, I'm, I'm happy to propose the minutes with that proviso. Okay. All right. oh, the Seconded. <laughs> And that was you, that was you, second issue. Thank you. <laughs> I keep forgetting about this. The Minister agreed. So we do, I can say, matters arising then. Um, through them, and tell me what you replies that you've had. Because um, I've been told that most of the, most of the uh, issues that were raised have had replies to them. So we'll, 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 shall, we do, shall we go through that? I'll do them page by page if that's okay. I'll do them by the big number page which we've got, starting with page seven. Okay, members? Yeah. Okay, so page one, page two. Are we going through the minutes? Yeah. Minutes, yeah. No, I think we've, we've agreed the minutes. Oh, no, but the matters are rising. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry, Ian. Yeah, accuracy, yeah, the accuracy bit you can't now come back on. But matters are rising, that's all. 56, uh, just one of the middle points, just ask members to send questions in to, to Julian or Mr Pike there uh, to ensure the report addressed all the concerns. That sort of repeats itself throughout the minute, so if members can do that to save us then having to get reports back thereafter, that would be useful. Is that okay? Anything else on page 8? Page 9. Chris, uh, Hugh, sorry. Question, mm -hmm. did we get the Plymouth figures? I think... Bullet what, point one. Yeah, I... I, I think we're including them in future. If you'd like them for the last um, report which was provided, I'll, I'll do that. At this remove of time, I see no purpose in that, mm -hmm. but... Uh, I think it was just that you did state that they would, you would distribute them. Yes, my fault. I'm sorry, we didn't. There are lessons to be learned. <laughs> Finally, it does make sense. I mustn't over-promise and under-deliver. It, it, it does make sense to have a list of matters arising at the end of the minutes that, mm -hmm. that actually says what we expect rather than trawling through yeah. them again, because actually that is, that's what I'm suggesting comes anyway in three weeks' time, a list of matters arising and any reports that, have, that, that are, have, were promised at the meeting but uh, have yet to be delivered. Yeah, Chair, do, do members have the very helpful coloured copy, coded copy, which I have? Ah, no, that's a shame. <laughs> because no, I, I have to say, the first time I saw it was at the briefing meeting that I had, so I had never seen a, a, a coloured copy before. Yeah. Or, or, or uh, things highlighted within it. That, that's a shame, because what, what Councillor Lyon wants has, has been done, and sadly... You haven't got it. Um, I've got a spare copy. I'll pass it over to you because that, that'll help us to get. What should we? It'll help us to get through the document. Shall we in future then to send whatever the coloured copies are? I think it's. it's I think the yeah. colours are, are yellow, blue, and green. Gone, and green. Yes. And and, and the don't various bits that have been done, not done, or whatever, are got to be sent to members. Is that okay then? So we'll do it that way rather than. I'm happy to share this between three of you. It might just help progress things as what we think of the different things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right, oh, here, here. I wasn't here, so. No, I wasn't here either. <laughs> <laughs> we were. This is fascinating. <laughs> 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 Anything else on page nine, members? That page nine is what page of the minute? Oh, the big page nine. I'm sorry. Oh, what have you got? The old. You've got, okay, page three. Page three. Is that okay? Should we mention Plymouth? Is that okay? Uh, page four. There's the MMD meeting, which we'll be arranging anyway, which is very top of that, or oh, top of my page, right? Um, again, um, suggesting that members raise queries so we can get written responses in advance there. But that, that is actually, we want a, uh, we want to be able to respond to a report prepared by the officers about their actions over the past, for, since inception of the ownership of MND, and then we can ask further questions if that would help the meeting. But 
we don't know what questions to ask until we know what the information we are being given is. Okay. Yep, that's understood. Yeah. So, uh, page four. You're sorry, on the coloured one, Ian, yeah, yeah, page four, yeah. Okay, page five. Yes, again, we don't, the Chair says there is a separate briefing. I think we suggested that a separate briefing would be arranged, this is on the bottom of page five, adult and would children. be arranged on ad adult and ch children's social care sections report that other queries on those issues should be addressed then. Um, we've received some papers, but we haven't received a briefing in person. And given that the contents at the time, I mean, it was an enormous amount of reading matter at the last, at the last meeting, um, but given that a lot of the concerns raised surrounded these two directorates, and it's not a question of blame or portioning anything, it's simply to get a handle on how difficult it is to be to stay within budget. And of course that is part of our job as audit and standards. We, we, you know, it is to ask these questions, but if we don't have the people here to ask the questions of, we can't get the answers we want. Chairman, if I can assist with that, uh, you'll recall at the briefing session the officers did turn up to brief members, but there weren't any members present. That was partly because I didn't have any paperwork until the day before, and I would have come to it, but I just, I mean, it struck me that... that it's because there was a change of chair at the council. We had, we had a change of chair. I, I understand the, the logistics of it, but even had the, they, you know, even though they turned up to that meeting, Sorry to interject, but can I suggest to help that perhaps at the next briefing session the officers can come along and if there's any further questions you can ask them at the briefing session. Rather than doing it in this meeting, which is a public meeting, which will obviously give mem members greater uh, ability and flexibility to be able to ask, ask questions which are perhaps of concern to them. So we can arrange that for the next briefing session. Yeah? Sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay, we will do. Sorry, we've got the dates for the next briefing session yeah. at some stage, haven't we? I'll tell you what they are anyway when we get there. Yeah. Um, running on from page five, additional information about IT transforming its network. How much is it expected to cost? When may, may we expect that kind of inf that information? We've only got, yes. We've got I think you've got it. No, we've got. No, so what have we, we got? Have, we have a, sh a sheet that says, what does it expect to cost? This is being worked on at the moment and involves discussions with many providers in some depth, which Sir Humphrey couldn't have put better himself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're waiting your knighthood. So, the question hasn't been answered. No. That's the point. I'll ask for further information provided. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any more? On page six. Uh, yeah. Page seven. Uh, yeah, we, we got another Sir Humphrey in response to a query about whether PCC considers outsourcing some of this work. Yes. And, and I mean, marvellous to see how many people are working so hard at at the capital projects, but it didn't answer the question whether we'd actually looked to see whether there isn't a kind of one-size-fits-all type of solution that's around in the ether that means we don't actually have to deploy quite so many resources and staff within the organisation to reinvent the wheel every time. Paragraph 2 on, on 7 with yeah. something. So the, the, the reply is not, doesn't give enough information, Ian? The like reply does, it tells us what they do, not whether they've considered doing it differently. Uh, okay, Michael, could you see if we can get uh, further? Oh, oh, or, or, or maybe at the next briefing meeting, if we've got uh, somebody with some responsibility for that as well. I, I think that would be helpful if we get somebody to come along and speak 
and explain yeah, what we so do. The director or somebody should be there at the briefing meeting, shouldn't they? Maybe. Yeah. But whoever's do deal we'll with this education, that. is that okay? Yes, Chair. Well, again, it, I'm, I'm sorry to, 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 to it, with, uh, that with regard with regard to page 89, which of course I don't have from oh, the previous one. No, no, not this one here, but the page 89 from the last one, which actually seemed to be rather early in the report, considering how large, large it was. There should be a comparison with Q4 2017 to make in order to make sense of the information, and the report does not include enough detail around context in terms of expected need or capacity. I'm not sure, although I've got, I think I've got a reply to it that the reply actually answers the questions. It tells us what they want us to know. It's not the same thing. I don't have that Adult services, yeah. sustainability strategy yeah. and things. Um, I, 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 again, I'm not sure because, because it doesn't tell me or us whether it's answering the questions that we've asked or it is simply a report telling us mm -hmm. what it's... Uh, uh, Perhaps that'll be best dealt with at the briefing session. Yep. Well, as long as it it's highlighted. It's highlighted that that's an issue that we actually like you know, answers to the questions yeah. rather than yeah. a kind of well, circumvention. The appropriate assistant director will be there and uh, fully empowered to be able to answer those questions. And next, in response to a concern raised about the time taken for hospital discharge, my specific question, and I know this is a personal thing because it was, I was relating the problem to my father who had been in hospital at the beginning of the year and spent two weeks that he didn't need to because he didn't, couldn't find an option, occupational therapist and we actually had to provide one privately, was, is the lack of provision of occupational therapists, which was highlighted in the report to us at the last meeting, a primary driver in preventing timely discharge from hospital? And if it is, what are we doing about it? But I didn't see any answer to that in the... In, in again, another report, all very pucker and nice, but doesn't answer my question. And I, I, I accept it; it actually isn't encapsulated in the minute. But it might not have been—I might not have made myself entirely well, clear at the point at the time. I, Chairman, I think Mr. Biddle, who will be coming along, will be able to answer that question. He's uh, the assistant director responsible for that area of the council's work. I have to say, Ian, in all the detail that we've been into hospital discharge and the various committees I sit on, we've never ever mentioned OT, so that's, that's very interesting. Okay? It just, I, I wouldn't have known about it if I hadn't yeah. seen it in operation. It happened in Wales, where they don't have an occupational therapist anywhere. I mean, they're worth the weight in gold. But it was the thing that prevented a lot of people from being discharged because the occupational therapist had to go to the home to see to make sure that the, the home environment was adequate for somebody to be discharged too. What, what I might do is, because there was a systems intervention a couple of years ago in relation to this, which was um, it proved not possible to implement uh, because of conflicting approaches being taken by the council and by the NHS. And I think it might be useful if I got one of the systems intervention team to come along at that briefing session as well yeah. to explain the difficulties which we had because the NHS decided to pursue a different route to the one which we thought perhaps would have been more helpful. I think I need to be as diplomatic as possible in the circumstances. Um, page 8 on the second paragraph, page 94 states that there were, more, were delays due to procurement issues for information and advice. Um, it's not specific to page 94 and 96, although it's, it's about this report. I do remember asking that we aggregated, in, and, and I can't see it in this new report, we ag aggregated the, those suppliers across departments, and I'm thinking for example of Mountjoy, so it appears in three departments, but it isn't an aggregated amount, so you don't, as a, uh, from a, an audit and finance point of view, you don't look at it and think, oh, that's really a lot more than we thought if you, if you take them, what they do for different departments together. So the idea was that we found out who is being paid the most from the council in any one quarter, and not which department was 
paying out than that. So that it was in terms of supplier, not departments, which I think would be very useful. But I didn't see it trans translated to the latest report. Chairman, I, I don't think we picked that up, but it will be picked up in future minutes, uh, future reports. Thank you. Any more on page 8? Page, page 8. Regard to page 200, yeah. seeing how long it was, the reference to 533 IT incidents. I asked for and received, and sort of ish, uh, a, an answer to how many people are employed in our IT department, and specifically how many first line, second line, and third line engineers are in the team. Um, it doesn't actually tell me, well, of course. I'm not necessarily assuming they have to, how many actually are dedicated to supporting the IT infrastructure by users, i.e., you know, we've got 3,000 users and we have, say, 25 employees whose job it is to operate a service desk and look after them and put things right. Um, so that was what I really wanted to know, and I didn't feel that it was as clear as it might have been. Thank you. We'll get further clarification. Thank you. Anything else on page 8? Page 9? Page 9, please. Um, fourth paragraph, the General Data Protection Regulations. We had a report which was work in progress, and there were obviously problems with the work which was in progress. Um, can we have a full update at, a, at the next meeting of where we've got to on General Data Protection? Michael. Um, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, because <laughs> I chair the board, so I should be knowledgeable about the area. Um, I'm wondering whether it might be helpful if I was to, do all members wish to be briefed on this, or would you like me to start with Councillor Mason, because uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to go through it in quite a lot of detail to explain what we're doing, and perhaps to even invite you along to our next board meeting, so we can explain what we're doing uh, across the council to ensure compliance. Chairman, if that is possible, I would certainly like to go, but I think we do need a report coming back to us because it impinges on the way in which we, on the governance of this institution, that um, the information which informs governance. So we do need a report coming to this committee. Chairman, I, I, through you, I'm happy to invite Councillor Mason along and then we'll produce the report as well. Yeah, so I mean that might help us to uh, actually deal directly with any specific concerns which you've got, because uh, there is a lot of work which has been done, and there's a lot of work still has to be done, as there as is the case with all large organisations across the country, because everyone is struggling, amongst other things, to ensure that the IT works in the way in which it is now required, and we do have difficulties. A number of the IT suppliers are slow in adopting their systems. Yeah, and we do also know that even though there was a specific date, that it, it, it has sort of slipped in terms of practicality. But my concern is still with Oracle because uh, even if we can obfuscate apparently HR related data, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's obfuscating uh, the account details and details of residents of Portsmouth if it's just HR. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me or us that that is an acceptable alternative from the Information Commissioner. And it also worries me because it means we've still got the information somewhere on our system that if you went through a back door into it, presumably not through the main portal, you'd be able to interrogate that data. Um, I mean, it might be a difficult exercise. It might be not very worthwhile for... for uh, some hackers, but I would imagine that we are still, to an extent, vulnerable. Uh, perhaps we'll arrange a meeting with Council Lyon can join us at the same time, and then we can go through that uh, in detail. We're working on that, um, and we think we've come up with the best solution we can. Understand the point, completely agree. Uh, there are lots of difficulties around, because these systems were not designed to deal with this particular problem. Retrofitting is always a difficulty. But we, we're mindful exactly of the point which he's raising, and we're doing our best to deal with it. If you do, <coughs> if you do get a date for the meeting, perhaps so all the members of the panel could be invited. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll try, no, no, I'll no, try. No, 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 no. Obviously it's a Friday, which is the day which is going to suit, 
Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to try and go through that with members to give them reassurance that we're doing what we can. Thank you. I think that's on page eight. Page nine. Did you receive, Chairman, a briefing on the briefing meeting, uh, the full report on the mitigation strategy? No. Um, I don't think I don't think I did. I don't think I've seen it in the pa in the pack of additional papers either. Um, I, I Sorry, can I say I didn't see the point because I was the only one there. So, and, right. and this had been raised in the meeting, I wasn't that so... No, no, I mean, it yeah. says, no, sorry, it says, Members asked that for the briefing meeting on 9th a full report to be brought on the mitigation strategy and how far that mitigation strategy will work and where there is a point at which we can no longer mitigate and where our services will seriously deteriorate. This is to do with our outsourcing, not outsourcing, with our um, selling our own services outside the Council mm. for the internal audit. And it's a matter I've raised, I think, with tedious monotony from everybody else, that if you take capacity out of an organisation for one thing and don't fill it with uh, further capacity to do the job it's supposed to be doing, then there are two questions arise. Why do we have so many people on the team before and paying them all to do a job that fewer people could do? Or we're doing, are we doing less or doing what we're doing less well as a result? Sorry, just to remind me, Chairman, for clarification, was this with regard to audit or was this with regard to capacity across the entire organisation? No, no, this is to do with the audit. The internal audit team is, yep. has, has got a lot of additional, mm. uh, you know, it's bringing income to the council, but, mm. but ultimately it's terribly important that it does its primary job as well as or better than it used to. Yeah, um, and, I, and I believe it is. Um, would you like to be individually briefed on that? Would that, be a, would that be a solution rather than a report being brought back here? Because I think there is a pretty simple answer. I'm, I'm surprised we weren't able to give that in the last meeting, actually, because, of course, we did have Lizzie with us, and she would have been able to immediately address that. But um, it's, well, I, I just don't think it warrants a report being produced. No. So we, we'll brief you direct? No. Yep. I can just add to obviously that briefly. I mean, we we work in what we think is a smarter way now. We've got some new software that allows us to conduct a lot more testing in a shorter space of time. So while the numbers may not have changed too much, the way we work is probably more streamlined than it had been before because of the new software we have. Okay, that was page 10, I think. Page 11, anything? Yeah. yeah. Thing. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Pike for the responses he has given to the questions I sent him. Um, however, I, I think it is just worth saying that the responses which he has given have raised more questions in my mind, and I remain very concerned about this particular project. And so I intend to send Mr. Pike some further questions, which I trust the answers to, given to them, will be distributed in the same way that the answers to the questions I asked after our last meeting uh, have been distributed. Julian. Uh, yes, yes, please, please, I'll be pleased to answer um, any questions that are submitted um, in accordance with the time frame that we've uh, agreed at this meeting. This is in relation to Hampshire Community Bank. Yeah. yeah. And just, just, there are people probably watching, just if we could tell them what it, yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, anything else, page 11? Yeah. Uh, okay, page 12. No, page 13. I have to ask on page 13. I didn't know what an ICO was. In, what do you think? What is it? The can charge is 20 million euro. That's right. It's the Information Commissioner's Office. That's the office which regulates um, Freedom of Information Data Protection. Okay. This chairman does underline one of the things which we raised at the you last did, meeting, did. that yeah. uh, we do need 
um, acronyms. Yeah. The acronyms. Yeah, because yeah. even if we speak in acronyms and understand them, people who are no, the two people who are watching this live um, yeah. may not understand them. Um, Chair, that's probably my fault because I normally put what they are the first time I mention yeah, them, sure. and I've neglected yeah, to do so. Yeah. On this occasion, I will do better in future. Okay, uh, page uh, 14. <clears throat> Again, ask the discussion to take place about the three D management panel at this meeting, or what, this at the next meeting. I don't see it. Am I right on the agenda? No, we. we could I, say, but I, I, I really haven't seen this. And I'm now the vice chair of the SMP. You know, scrutiny management panel. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't really know why it's here, Ian. So could okay. you? In order to pass the, um, the letter that, that provides some comfort to our auditors of how this council is governed and audited and the standards happen, there is a standard governance um, a, a sort of constitution, what it's supposed to do, and in it, it says what the scrutiny management panel is supposed to do, and in my time here, which I confess to be much shorter than anyone else's, uh, it has never done. The scrutiny management panel has never met that criterion. It, it, call in is not good enough. I mean, call in is obviously to look at specific decisions, but it is within the constitution. I, I haven't got it to hand because it's not in the, these minutes and notes. Whatever the constitution says, the scrutiny management panel should be doing more regularly and more vigorously what it isn't doing. Yeah, I think, well, I'm, I've just recently come on it myself, Ian. Uh, I know you were the vice chair of it last year, the year before, or whatever, right? But but I think it'd be useful. What I haven't got, and I couldn't, I haven't, couldn't find the constitution, is actually what the remit of it is. So it might be useful as that as a starter. I think, I think the thing to do is to furnish you with the letter that's gone out in the name of your predecessor to the auditors about what the governance audit and standards function is. And in that, encapsulated within that, is the description that your predecessor gave to them about what he thinks the scrutiny management panel is doing, and my question is whether or not we actually agree that, that with, with his thoughts on that matter. I've got a copy of that, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll provide a copy of that, and I think it would be really worthwhile to have a discussion in the next briefing session to really fully understand the remit of this committee. Because I, I think we have to be careful, because we, we have... The committee is a, is a strange beast, dare I say it, um, because it covers governance, um, it covers standards, and it covers audit. Its rule around standards and member behaviour, I think, is com relatively well defined, but it's three separate functions which have been bolted together, and they don't naturally overlap. Um, the audit function, I think, is quite clear. I think where we, we need to be careful is that we're not getting into areas of governance which we can't deal with but I'd welcome that discussion uh, if we could have it in a briefing session so we can really open up all of the concerns which there may be because I think sometimes we blend our governance role with our audit role and the two should be separate a um, bit of an academic point but it does have, have practical implications as to where we can actually go so we'll start by perhaps chair circulating that letter and then we can have that discussion. Uh, and also, sorry, and, and also whatever the Constitution currently says about the remit. Absolutely, and if the, if the remit is wrong, then let's address that as well. All right, just to help. My understanding, I don't know whether, whether it was in training or briefing or just osmosis, is that the Governance, Audit and Standards Committee examines and assesses executive action in that the policy has been made and we ask officers to implement it and our whole purpose in the governance and audit bit is to make sure that we are happy that the officers have adequately um, dealt with the things they've been charged to do and the scrutiny management panel is a panel which looks at policy from the administration so, um, so it is actually quite defined I think and, and it, there, there is a differential that's that's quite clear if you look at it in those terms so when for example we got a note back from whomever wrote it about MMD that it's not our job to do something it wasn't what I was suggesting that we actually tell the cabinet what to do with MMD 
I was asking, and I think we all ask on this, meet, on this, on this committee, what the officers did and whether what the officers did was the right thing. That is our job. And I don't really see it as, as, as being confused with anything. It's, but I, I, I do see people thinking that lines are blurred, but I don't think we've ever told the Cabinet or anybody what to do. We've simply said, was it done correctly? Yeah, happy to have that discussion. Yeah. You were just about quarter down, weren't you? It's a third, isn't it? Well, I think that's something we need to look at as well, having a third of me two members deciding the whole future of the council. It's uh, disgraceful. <laughs> Chairman, if it is Councillor Lyon and myself, oh. it is in safe hands. Apology. T I take that back. Shall we move on then? So it's item four, it's the uh, audit performance status report to the 10th of October 2018. And I think that's Michael. Is it Michael? Is it good self, Michael? Are you? Who's dealing with this? Oh, you're dealing oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm looking the wrong way. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So this is our standard update report taking you up to the 10th of October for the planned audit activities for 1819. You'll see on page 21 we are at 47% complete or in progress. And that's made up of 30% where the report has been issued, 5% that's in draft, and 12% that's currently in progress. Um, you'll see on page 29, that is the list of audits that have been completed since the last meeting and a breakdown of their assurance levels and a small summary. Um, previously, we've talked about the follow-up actions and how they progressed, and that's now included in the main body of the report. That is on page 23, I believe. And that gives you a breakdown of how the follow-ups are being uh, reviewed and the results. If you recall, previously we were at a low percentage, around 41% uh, for the total year in 17-18. So you'll see at the moment that it is increased up to around 70%, but we do still have 17 follow-ups left to conduct. So obviously that number could change, so it is a, a moment in time. Uh, you'll also see that on page 24 you requested an update on the MMD audit plan. So there you'll see uh, the audits we're conducting, the status they're in, and when you can expect to see them. So that reporting date is the dates that they, we expect them to come to this committee. Um, you'll also see on uh, the same page, sorry, that is page 24, there's some, been some small amendments to the audit plan where we've had an increase in some of the schools that have been requesting audits. So they have come in and replaced other audits that have been re-risk assessed and are no longer cons uh, considered high risk. Um, other than that, I wasn't. I didn't need to bring anything else to your attention. We've had no critical risk or no no assurance audits since the last meeting, so there was nothing else to bring to your attention. But I'm obviously happy to take any questions. I have just a couple of questions, and I throw it open. Just on the on the on the schools bit. Schools come and request us. We there, there's not. We we don't have a plan to do every school over a given period. Uh, no, we don't. We can include schools in the audit plan if we need to, but schools buy in our service. They are not required to have an internal audit. However, we do offer our services to them. Um, if there was a serious concern uh, about a budget at a school or we heard from finance, we will go in and conduct an audit, but at the moment they don't have to have one. Well, and from us, presumably they need to be audited in some form or other? Not in relation to internal audit, no. Please. Just on that point, um, for clarification, um, it's only schools that are LA maintained that we would audit, or do we do academies in the city? We haven't, sorry, via the chair, we haven't had any academies request the service. We have offered our service out to academies, but we haven't had any come back as of yet. I should pretend. Sorry, at the top of 
What numbers you got? A twenty-five. Yeah, or ah, yeah, but if you got twenty-five, yes. you got it. Okay. Um, at the top of page twenty-five, it talks about high, thirty-four high risk, seventeen medium risk. Should we be worried about that? Um, for, for comparison, at the same point last year, we were at forty-five high risk, fifteen medium, and zero low risk. So it's very hard to say at a midpoint in the year because obviously you know, the audits happen. They don't happen regularly in the sense that we're going to do that as, as the same percentage each quarter. So it's very hard to say. But at the moment, it's lower than it was last year. But until we get to the end of the year, it's very difficult to say where that's going to end up. But it, Could I rephrase that question? Should Lizzie be worried about them rather than us? At the moment, I don't think there's anything out of the ordinary in those high risks. Um, if I might just uh, the other question is that I think we tried to get a, and I know you give us a lot of information, but we actually tried to work to, to have a indication of the month that the audit happened in each of the events that you've got. So on your chart on page 29, it would be useful to know, I mean it doesn't have to be sort of specific, but say June 2018 when it happened, because it says last implementation date. Um, it, that, I, that, I don't actually, to be frank, I don't know what that means. I just, I, I'm assuming that, I, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, we don't need to know what it means, but it's, it's, it's useful. It'd be more useful to know when the audit was happening, but, I, I, and uh, perhaps, just to satisfy my stupidity, um, what a last implement date, implementation date actually means. Okay, uh, so the reason we've put that in is there was a request to know when the actions that the client had agreed were going to complete those actions. So that's what that implementation date is trying to show you. Apologies if the wording's not clear, we can change that wording. So that, yeah, that's the date they said they were going to have the, the latest action. Not all actions have the same date. They're going to finish some are longer than others, but that's the latest date. So obviously we can, we can kind of rebrand that if possible. And yeah, we can certainly add a deadline for, de deadline for implementation, something like that. Yep, that's Would fine. And again, I can also add in the date in which the audit was issued at the, at the front, so you can see. Well, that allows us to do is then work out whether we think it's reasonable for them to wait a year to do something or not, because mm. if, if they've got a deadline for April 19 and it happened in May 2008, we could say, how long does it take to do this then? I mean, it, it just, that would be helpful. Could I, could I just, uh, sorry here, I'll finish my little bit, but that's okay. Uh, just on Appendix A itself, and, and just a simple question. If we got, well, it's about six down, travel and subsistence, uh, and, and failure to comply with something, and then mobile phones, same sort of thing. Are these centralised, or, or does each department deal with their own? Uh, in relation to travel and subsistence, it's done via a self-service portal. It's done via EBS, so you do a self-service claim. It then goes to your line manager to authorise. But I presume in advance of that, if we talk about uh, uh, driving license somewhere, wasn't it? Yeah, not issued a driving license or not been aware. How can you? I'm, I'm, how could somebody um, authorise uh, a claim for somebody driving who hasn't shown the driving license? So that's one part of the process that's not on the system. So it's managers are required to. It's not on the EBS. The so managers are required to ensure that anyone who drives for council business under their kind of manager that they have cited their driving license. Uh, the issue that came up there was when we then sampled a number, there was a number that hadn't conducted that check. And, and, and sorry, the mobile phones, are they, are they centralised? I thought they were, but obviously I'm wrong. The mobile phones are centralised in the sense that they are ordered via the IT service, however they are managed individually by coordinators in each directorate. So the issue that came up in that audit was that there was a um, an ina inadequate trail and inconsistency in how those coordinators were processing those mobile phone applications. That's fine, thank you. Hugh? Yes, on the same Appendix A, uh, for Durn, Modern Records. Um, the implementation date is between last month and two years' time. Is there a plan for the changes which are required? Has it been costed? Has it been accepted? And uh, how will it be implemented, basically? If you can give me a couple of minutes, I can look that up as, as much as I've got. I don't know if a Michael can assist on, on that one at all. A modern record, isn't it? 
Yeah. Does it mean yeah. it's not? Does it mean it's not? It's, not it's, it's a modern way of recording things that are <laughs> old records, like archives, or does it mean that it does is modern records, but we haven't worked out how to put them on? What it, why it's called that, apparently, is because it's not the archived records, it's not the historic records, it's the records which are more likely to be current. But having said that, we keep records for up to 75 years in respect of children's cases, which some people might think aren't very modern records. So it's the non-historic records of the Council, of which there are a lot. I, think, I don't think we've got the information on that at the moment, do we, Paul? So the latest date was around the corporate retention schedule. Yeah. That was the 2020, and the agreed action was... Um, so the issue was the corporate retention schedule is kind of ever-evolving, and uh, a start was made to update it and include more information as to what the reason for that retention was. Previously, it would say, hold this record till that date, but you weren't sure what the whether there was legislation behind it. So that's now been updated. <coughs> Uh, to a point, um, and the officer that was in charge of that was on a secondment, they've gone back. So the issue was about completing that retention schedule. So obviously there would be a period of time needed to do that for the departments to look into that and research what, they, what it is that's behind that retention schedule. Okay. Is that okay with you? You okay? It doesn't answer my question, which was on timing and costings, and uh, perhaps you can come back to us on that one, whether this, how it is going to be operated. Okay, um, happy with that. Happy with the, so the recommendations for four are members to note the audit performance up to the uh, 10th of October, and the highlighted areas of control weakness from from the from the plan. Is that okay? We also place our thanks on record because actually it's a very good concise report. Uh, it's easy to read, unlike the next one. And um, and ultimately, you know, um, it's, it's, this is what are we here for. And if we have something with this clarity, and all we're asking for is a few dates in, and uh, that's what makes our lives a lot easier. So, so thank you. I have to say, I find the next one interesting, but there you are. <laughs> interesting, but not, a, but not as clear, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're on to five, which is Treasury Management Mid-Year Review, mid Review for 1819. That's you, Michael. Sorry, I jumped in too quick earlier. It's fine. Um, yeah, it's a report which is uh, going on to Cabinet and the Council, and it's uh, brought here for scrutiny. Um, I'd accept it's not the easiest of subjects, but that's why we bring it here, and we do our best to try and make it readable. <laughs> Um, the um, recommendations are, there's a couple which slightly amend our policy on setting aside money to repay for council's debt. The first one involves um, investment properties that were financed from unsupported borrowing. At the moment, our policy was that we would repay for borrowing from the capital receipt when we sold for properties. But there is um, a small risk that if the value of the property falls, the capital receipt will be insufficient to um, repay for debt. So there's a recommendation that in the event of the market value of an investment property falling below the price we bought it for, we would set aside funds to cover the um, shortfall between the expected sale price and what we paid for it over the residual life of the property. Uh, the second amendment to our policy on providing a repayment of debt concerns equity shares. Um, our existing policy was not to provide for the repayment of that debt because we don't expect the value of the shares to go down and we're not subject to depreciation in the way that physical assets are. However, 
there is no intention to sell those shares and therefore there's no um, money being set aside to repay that debt so we're proposing that we provide for the repayment of those debts over 25 years on an annuity basis. Um, next recommendation is that we simply ask you to note that um, we haven't identified any breaches in the Treasury Management Policy and we also ask you to uh, note the prudential indicators, the Treasury Management indicators in Appendix A which contain a number of parameters within which the Treasury Management function should be operating and shows where we are against those parameters. Um, we haven't undertaken any borrowing this financial year and we, at 30th of September we had £414 million pounds invested at an average return of 1.07%. I'm happy to answer any questions per annum. Um, I don't mind, Chairman, I do have a couple of questions. It may, may turn into a few more than a couple. Um, and this presumably is both to Michael and to Julian. Um, my understanding of, of, of our obligation now that, was, that, that recently was put in by the gov central government was that we were supposed to set aside 2% per annum of any capital sum uh, to meet the pay repayment of any debt that we, we have. It seems to me that we have actually decided to circumvent that rule uh, by changing entirely what we intended to do and decide that we're going to sell the asset at the end of the end of the process, say for example a shopping mall in Swindon or whatever. Um, this is different, I understand, from, from where we were a year ago, that we were actually looking to garner 2% of the actual value of our investments every year at a small rate. I was always saying we should put them in equities, but um, not the ones we're putting them into at the moment. Um, so the question is first, is that right? Have we changed our policy to get around, to circumvent the 2% per annum uh, provision? Uh, the simple answer to that is no. The Council sets um, has discretion to set its MRP policy that it has to agree uh, with its external auditors, which we have done. The Council's MRP policy is and always has been regarding investment properties was that because the intention was to churn the investment assets over a number of years, the intention was never to hold our, our investment property assets for a long period of time. The intention was always, therefore, that when we did churn one of the buildings that we bought from our investment properties, the capital receipt we received from the sale would then be used to repay the debt for that that was taken out in order to purchase that asset originally. What we're putting in place now is just a, is an extension to the policy that says in the outside um, risk that in the event that we came to sell one of these properties, there was a shortfall in the value of that property that we had available to then repay the outstanding debt. As soon as we identified there'd been a, de a devaluation in the property, we'd set aside separate funds equal to that shortfall to repay I completely understand that. that. I don't, I don't, I'm not arguing with the MRP, which is the minimum um, uh, point of revenue provision. Uh, I'm arguing um, about the point about buying investments in the first place, which was that you can, you can borrow for 50 years and hold on to them for 50 years, and over that 50 years, as money decreases in value, which it will, the, the, the debt itself will reduce in, as a percentage of the, of the capital uh, value of the, of, 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 of the council, because assuming that we go with inflation and it stays the same. So actually the idea was that we pay off the debt rather than sell off the asset, because the idea was to have a portfolio of assets, maybe I'm, it's changed, but to have a portfolio of assets that would generate income to cover services that central government was not going to be covering now and probably into the future. So what you're telling me instead is actually you're going to sweat the asset 
sell it and then we've got actually no advantage apart from the fact that we've been able to we've been able to use the income the excess income over the cost to provide for services that strikes me as being fairly short-sighted if we've got a 50-year plan we've borrowed the money for as long as that we've got uh, you know, and, and if we if we are trying to avoid and you haven't actually you told me the short answer is no I don't know whether the long answer is yes that we're trying to avoid the provision by central government that when you borrow money you have to put 2% of the capital sum aside what we were doing as I understand before was we were putting money aside but then putting it back into investment so actually we were putting we were just compounding the possible problem of a a fall in a particular type of market, say for example commercial property, because we'd be putting all the money into that as opposed to, for example, which I would prefer to do, put 2% straight into equities, not our own, but equities sort of managed by London, which I think would work as a kind of endowment mortgage process for buying asset. However, that's not presumably what you're doing, but also I'm, I'm concerned that we are trying to avoid the 2% uh, stipulation by central government because I think it's a sensible thing to do rather than run these assets for as long as we can, get them to produce some money and then sell them. Um, I presume when we sell them we won't be able to buy something else or if we do there's going to be a cost involved and therefore the question is why would we sell them and buy something else. It strikes me that we are adopting or you're asking the cabinet or you're asking the council to adopt a policy which is completely at odds with the reason for doing it in the first place. The uh, government's recent guidance is that debt should be repaid within 50 years. It doesn't say that it should be 2% a year, so the council's free to decide how it profiles the repayment of debt itself, or indeed to uh, make alternative arrangements if they're appropriate. In the case of the investment properties, we don't expect to hold any of them for anything like 50 years, and therefore the debt will be repaid well before 50 years. But are you creating policy or following policy, which is the question of, re re as governance order stands can be asked, are you making policy or following it? Are you saying to the current administration, we suggest you do this because it would be sensible, or are you saying, this is the policy that happened before, we want you to change it to this? I, don't, I, I, I want to know who's driving this particular, this particular decision that we effectively completely change what we had originally envisaged this whole property portfolio to be and to do. We're amending or building on the previous policy because under a certain set of circumstances it would not have repaid the debt with 50, within 50 years. So we're effectively changing our policy a little to ensure that we're in line with the government's guidance. Can, can, I, just, can I just add an, a clarification that we are not changing the core MRP policy at all on how we intend to repay? I want to focus on the MRP policy. That is not the point. I'm not asking. The MRP is simply a, as I understand, a little mechanism which says if commercial property prices fall a certain distance and the debt that's held against those properties is therefore greater than the current value of it, we have to make some provision over a period of time. I have no problem with that. I'm talking about how we purchase those assets. What you're telling us is from a purchase idea, we're going to a leasing idea. In other words, we're taking advantage of a, uh, a, a preferentially straight for us over what we get for rents for those properties. But we don't intend that those properties should in the future form a basis for value in the council because we intend to sell them. <laughs> that is not the original policy, it is not the plan that I have listened to and voted on in Council, and it's not what I understand, although I'm not sure what the new administration's policy is, but I doubt, I doubt it is their policy. What I'm asking you is, are you creating policy, which it seems to me you are, or following policy, which it seems to me you're not? 
Well, Chairman, at the end of the day, um, this really isn't a fair question for the officers. The officers provide advice, and this report has been produced. It now has to come here for consideration. It will go on to Cabinet. It will be approved by Council. It's members' decision. Sorry, Chairman. I accept that. But if it's a policy change that is not flagged up, and luckily some of us actually understand it to be one, and to flag it up, it, it is a means of bringing about something that officers want without informing the administration or members what it is they're aiming to do. It seems like a very anodyne report. If you read into it what it actually means for the council, it isn't. It is a complete change from what a previous administration put in place, and I don't know, as I say, what the current one does. It is not, I don't think that these reports are, 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 should be a means of changing policy by the back door. Um, we've not changed any of the capital, the investment property acquisition strategy compared to how it was originally approved. We have not changed how in under normal circumstances we would repay the debt that we have taken to acquire those investment properties. All we're, all we're doing here is expanding on that policy because we were silent in our policy on what we would do in the event that there was insufficient um, value in the property when we sold it to repay the debt. All we are saying now is in the event that there was insufficient value in the property to repay the debt, this is what we will do, whereas before we had never said what we would do be because it was an omission from that policy. But, but you did say the word acquisition. I like the word acquisition because it sounds like we own the things and keep owning them and th that the whole idea is to keep owning them or owning similar investments rather than borrowing against them at 100% of value or whatever we do and simply sweating the assets. I mean, that's what, what, what we are effectively doing. In, in, and this is not what I'd understood to be the case or to be the order from the previous administration to the executive to lease assets. That's what we are doing. If, if, if you're arguing that this is the process that you think should be happening, that we sell the asset in order to, 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 to repay the money, it is leasing by any other name the asset, and that is not acquiring the asset, which I thought was what we were doing. No, we're not leasing the asset, we are acquiring the asset. The mechanism is we identify a property in the market that, that the council wishes to buy. Um, a the uh, a financial appraisal is done on that that looks at the income streams that it will generate to the council, f as, as you've exactly said, where the income stream is greater than the borrowing cost, so therefore it generates a benefit to the council. We then acquire that asset, and that, ac and that asset goes onto our balance sheet as an investment property. In order to fund that asset, we borrow the money. Um, we, under normal circumstances, though, we would then repay debt over a period of time. But in the event, but in the, our, our MRP policy says specifically for investment properties, because the intention is to is to churn those properties over a period of time to ensure that the the, le the income that we receive from those properties is secure. Because as as the lease holders term of lease reduces, the value of that lease reduces. So we ensure that we only hold on to properties that have good provenance long leases, so we will dispose of them as those 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 lease terms reduce. Um, on, on disposal of that property, we will then receive cash income, which we call a capital receipt. We will use that to repay the debt. Um, I, 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 I have to refer to my friend over, over there, because he was actually on the cabinet when this policy came into effect, was it to buy these things and sell them, or was it to buy them and fund those the, the, the purchase over a period of time, so we actually owned them long term? It, uh, it, it's a long time ago, and obviously um, lots have changed. But actually, my understanding was that it was it wasn't just to um, buy them to sell them; it was actually for income. I remember that it wasn't to do that. And what you have, what you've put to the council, whether or not it's the right thing or wrong thing, and whether it's your fault or not, is a mechanism that does not reflect what the administration thought it was doing. And I, I, I'm simply raising it because we are in governance audit standards to say that I think that is different from what we had expected. And if you put it in front of the cabinet and they agree to it, clearly they're entitled to it. I think they ought to be told that it is a departure from the original plan. Um, and what I would say is that
this report is only concerned with how we provide for the repayment of debt. In terms of the acquisition of commercial properties, they are certainly valid points, but they're beyond the remit of this report, <laughs> and they will be addressed in the capital strategy, which will be brought to the Cabinet and the Council before the new financial year. Michael, I, 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 I'm so sorry to be going on about this. If you put something in the report that is passed by Cabinet, and you say at some time in 10 years' time, well, it was in this report that we were going to sell the properties and that's what we're going to do, then I can see successors, successor members go, oh, all right then. And I, therefore, I want to challenge something I don't think is right within a report you're putting to Cabinet, because I don't think that's what was intended. But you've put it as the Council's policy that they are going to sell these properties to, uh, and, and to, to raise the capital in order to repay the debt. That is what you've written. That's what goes to Cabinet. If Cabinet agrees this report, they're agreeing to that mechanism, it seems to me. Um, I can only reiterate that the original policy that set the decision to invest in these investment properties as an income stream, part of that strategy would have been to churn the assets at appropriate times as, as the investment manager Prove it. Okay. Well, Prove it. I, I'm sure, I'm, I, th I suspect that is something which we can do. Um, and I'm sure from the information which I have from my personal knowledge discussions I've had with our property people who deal with it, that was the understanding that we would not acquire these assets for a lifetime. We would anticipate that we'd purchase the assets and then there is a good financial reason for disposing of them because these types of commercial assets don't necessarily continue to increase in value and over a period of time the policy had been to dispose of the assets and acquire new I understand that. I'm not saying that within a portfolio of property you don't sort of churn it, and, but I was assuming that we were purchasing a portfolio of property and funding over 50 years the capital so that at the end of the day, having borrowed whatever we were borrowing, we had that money in a fund that belonged to us as opposed to belong to the borrower, to, to the lenders. This is where my issue arises. I have no problem with the MRP, I have no problem with the idea of churning properties. I have a problem with us effectively leasing them. That is that we are simply taking the interest turn on what it costs us to borrow and what they are paying in rent. That is what you're telling me is the only benefit of having these, and I mean, obviously help the council finances, but it's not what I understood we were trying to do. Chairman, I just don't think we can take this any further. Julian, did you want to add anything to that, just quickly? Um, well, 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 no, only other than to say that the the intention was always to only repay the debt that we took out on these properties at the time that we disposed of those assets back to the market. Um, and just to clear that these properties are not leased, the properties are, are owned by the City Council, these are not leasing arrangements, and leasing does, does, does not enter into the property investment strategy. It's an analogy, it's an analogy. I know we don't. I, I'm just saying that it is effectively doing that because we are giving them back at the end of the day, but we're selling them and giving the money back. So it is an effect. We are not, we are not buying long-term asset. We are just using asset that we've been able to finance. OK, thank you. Hugh? It seems to me, Chairman, that there is a, a clear difference here between the understanding of my colleagues on my right and my left as to what was the policy which they instituted and the way in which it has been interpreted by the um, finance section. I think that uh, this does is a proper concern of a governance and audit committee and I would ask that a report be brought to us outlining a the current strategy and b how this accords with the decisions which were made by cabinet and ratified by council okay that's okay that'll be for the next meeting yeah. any other point in this i know i'm sure you have ian but you're happy to, happy to <laughs> sit in the hand yeah okay there are three four I thought you finished. Still on this one, yeah, still on five, yeah.
Appendix C, uh, page 41. The Council has some externally managed corporate bond holdings. These consist of tradable debt issued by commercial companies. Um, can you advise me, um, as someone who does not know much about this particular area, uh, do we just have one uh, external manager for this, uh, for these corporate bond holdings, or do we use a number of companies? And the idea of tradable debt always puts uh, the idea of a slightly enlarged risk at the back of my mind. Uh, what is the risk associated with buying debt? Um, well, we have a um, £7 million pound, um, amount invested in externally managed corporate bonds. We do only have... Um, one manager at the moment because it is quite a small um, portfolio. Um, in terms of the risks attached to tradable debt, providing you intend to hold them to maturity, they're actually probably less risky because if you had a term deposit, you'd be locked in wherever the term was. Because it's tradable, it's possible to um, sell for debt should we need the money early, or indeed should we want to uh, take some profit from it. That more or less answers the question, Jim. So, so it talks at some point about, about equities. It's a, a, a little bugbear of mine that we don't actually have the right kind, if we have any at all. Um, it seems to me we have three equity investments that I know of. One is in HCB, one is in MMD, and the other is in Vessel. Where did they appear in the Treasury Management Mid-Year Report Review? Because it must be investment of some kind. None of those... Um, well... Hampshire Community Bank, the equity was funded from a capital program, so it's not part of Treasury management. I believe the same is true of Vessel, and certainly MMD was also acquired through the capital program, and therefore those shares are not part of the Treasury management function. So I understood that this tells us how much we owe and how much we own uh, completely, everything, within money. And, I, I'm, and, and we are talking about equities, you're talking about corporate bonds, you're talking about, you know, and you actually do mention the word equities, which, um, so recommendation 3.2 on the top of page 34, it says the Council 16 policy is that no MRP is made on self-financed borrowing to fund equity shares purchased in the policy objectives unless the shares are sold, in which case capital receipt is set aside to repay the debt. Well, I don't know what MMD, Vessel and HCB are not are if they're not equity shares purchased in pursuit of policy objectives. So um, it seems that it, it appears in a recommendation. It appears as a an element. It is not in our... Why do we think that they, they, they don't form part of the Treasury management function, even if they're just stuck in a corner? We need to know what we have in asset, whether it's tradable. And you've actually got here sort of things that aren't tradable that we just sit on. Why are our, why are our equity investments in our own companies or any others not registered in this review? And why do they not form part of this lovely pie diagram on page 41 that tells us where all our money is? Because I don't see where our £20 million or whatever it is in MMD is, or our £1.5 or £2 million into Vessel, or our £2.5 million in HCB, and I don't know why it isn't being reported, because this is the only place it can be. The Treasury Management function covers, and therefore the Treasury Management reports, cover the Council's borrowing and its investment of surplus cash. Recommendation 3.2 does refer to equity shares, but that is the debt that was used in order to fund the acquisition of those shares 
rather than for shares themselves. Um, do, do, do you, sorry, sorry Chair, uh, do, um, do you recall the paper I circulated that set out the, um, the, um, the circumstances under which we undertake financial transactions using Treasury powers and when we take, um, undertake financial transactions using our capital powers. The, um, this pie chart is only concerned with um, the borrowing and lending of money, or sort of the lending of money under our treasury management powers where we're lending out surplus, only our surplus cash flow that, and that's all this pie chart relates to. Well, I, no, I don't recall that. I probably was, it was my fellow year not being on this committee when that happened. Um, but it still begs the question, where do we find, if you say that, you're talking about money, money, but also value, value. I mean, what, what's the point of just telling us about the money and not about the assets and the liabilities? I can't understand why we just sit on, on a committee that's dealing with everything that the council does in terms of its, what it owns and what it, what it owes, and we're only told a bit of it, which is our cash element, which, we've, which, which allows us to say it's, it's a borrowing to buy something that we don't then know about. We just know that it exists somewhere, but we don't have, a, we don't have sight, because you've just told me that it's effectively the cash flow in and out of, 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 of the council, but not what's underlying it, what our assets are, where our uh, maybe you just don't want us to know what our assets are and where they are, but actually, are we saying that the council's assets are greater than £616 million, pounds, less 414 and where are they? Can Sorry, I could I just ask on this, because uh, I, I, my reading of it is that there are things like MMD, which somehow or other, whether in the red or the black or whatever, don't seem to come to this committee. Are you saying they don't have to? And all the council's assets and its liabilities are included on its balance sheet, which we bring to this committee after year end. Yes, but if you can read it and understand it, then you should be doing Michael's job and not mine. Um, <coughs> but, uh, and that Michael's job possibly and not mine. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that that is the most important document that exists in the council. And if we're going to spend. 20, 20 minutes to half an hour just, just discussing where the cash is going, we should at least have an opportunity to spend 20 minutes to half an hour actually working out what the council has and owes and, and spends, as opposed to tacking it onto the end of a, an annual report, which we don't have time to read because we've only given it five minutes before the meeting, so we can't scrutinise it. The balance sheet exists. It actually is a monthly event because somebody must do a balance sheet every month. We should see the balance sheet of the council at every meeting of the Go Governance, Audit and Standards Committee. Then you look at the ins and outs, the balance sheet, and preferably one that isn't completely obfuscated by anything else. What is out of that, Julian? Um, wh well, we, we, only, we, we only produce a balance sheet on an annual basis. We, we don't revalue our assets or, yeah. or carry out a full balance sheet review on a monthly basis. Um, I don't think there would be enough days in the month to enable us to do that. So we produce it, one, we only do our full revaluations and analysis once a year, so we wouldn't be able to do it on a monthly basis. Okay. You're telling me that you don't know what's happening to the, 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 the city's assets and liabilities on a monthly basis. I don't know a company that can't produce a balance sheet every month, whether it's BP, uh, NatWest. NatWest knew what its balance sheet was like, so I went to the Prime Minister and said, you've got to bail us out. I, it is impossible to believe. We don't have to revalue the assets on the balance sheet, apart from every year. We do have to know what's, what the value of the business, which is the council, is uh, more frequently than once a year and with five minutes opportunity to look at it. Uh, it just seems to me that, again, we are, we, 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 we're seeing and tasting the froth on the cappuccino and never getting to the coffee. And so I would just ask that we get to the coffee, and a balance sheet would be very useful, even if we look at the old one and actually get to have it, have it um, discussed. 
When I say we're, in, we're not in a position to be able to produce a balance sheet on a monthly basis, what I mean by that is it would not be physically possible for us, for example, to every month have a pension actuarial revaluation undertaken, which would enable us to produce a balance sheet as at that point in time. Right. I'm not asking for something as, as um, detailed as that, because I can understand that at the end of the year we say, right, we'll do a recalculation for the auditors. Um, that's fine. I just want to know, every month we do have a movement in the, in the value of our assets and liabilities, as any large organisation would, and we only see the froth. We only see what happens in the Treasury management, which is easy to deal with because it's only 1% we're getting there, and, and it's, it's, it's a lot of money, so it's very impressive, but it doesn't explain to the members what it, the value of the council is at any one time. Um, what will happen to individual or individual portfolio holders will receive a, um, a, re a report uh, normally on a monthly basis that does tell them what new capital expenditure has been incurred over the period. So from that perspective, we do report to portfolio holders at least capital expenditure on schemes that would result in an asset. We're not portfolio holders. Budget. We are holding officers to account on this. So we're not, we don't have the privilege of seeing these things. It is what governance audit, I'm, I, just, I just want to try to explain, we need to know some things which we are not finding out or not knowing about. And every time I come to a meeting of these, I find out there's more that I don't know because I ask a question and find it's not in that bit, it's on somewhere else, but you don't get to see it. Like, for example, asking about the three investments we've made that I know about that I never get to see. Chairman, I, I don't think it was ever envisaged whenever this committee was set up that the Council would produce balance sheets on a, a quarterly, monthly, six-weekly basis to this particular committee. Um, that's not how the Council functions, and we don't have the Minister resources to do that. That would be an impossible task for us. That, that cannot happen. Okay, but you can, sorry, Chairman, you can tell us what's happening with bits of money going in and out, and, and actually it's a fairly comprehensive report, we can see that. What, I mean, what do other councils do? Do they provide a balance sheet every so often, or do they not? I mean, they don't no. know. No. And you're sure? Yes. <laughs> I have this role in two councils, I have not come across that in any audit committee, in any council I've worked in, I've worked in probably seven across Hampshire. So how do we find out? You find out because the... Would, Julian, would you like to...? Um, well, port port portfolio holders will receive a report um, at, their, at their individual cabinet briefing meetings, and if, and if they wish to take that to their main cabinet meeting, then they can, and then those, those reports are in the public domain. So where would MMD be then? In the, uh, which of the portfolio holders will have MMD and which will have Vessel and which one will have... The, 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 M M M M any capital expenditure relating to MMD would be going to resources portfolio because that's where that part of the capital programme is reported. Is that new spending or existing spending or what we've already got and what we're spending as well? Any, any new approved, any capital expenditure that is new in month that has been approved as part of the City Council decision of approving the overall capital programme in February is reported to the resources portfolio holder. Yeah, it's not good. I think we're going to run in circles on this one. Perhaps we could, when we decide what the remit of this committee is, and we'll, we'll discuss that at the next year. We'll decide where that's going. Ian, did I, did I hear you name dropping that? Did, did you say, as, as I said to the Prime Minister recently, did you say that? Hey, sorry, what I said was when, when Sir Fred Goodwin, that's a name I don't, I don't, never met him, and he's no longer Sir Fred, uh, discovered the day before, or whatever it was, that they had run out of money, literally run out of money, they went to the Prime Minister, but they knew they'd run out of money because they had a balance sheet which told them they had on a day-to-day -day basis, as banks do. And my question was simply, if they have one, and I, I realise it's more crucial because when they run out of money, it affects a lot of people. Uh, I find it extraordinary as somebody who runs businesses, uh, has been, that, that when, when we have monthly meetings, management accounts, the balance sheet is always updated because it isn't that difficult to do you then have a revaluation of assets at the end of the year, but the balance sheet is effectively what we think at any one time the business is worth. 
If I may, Chair, just, just to allay any concerns, I can confirm that we have an understanding of what our cash balances are on a daily basis. Um, there is no doubt whatsoever that we do not precisely know our cash position at any particular point in time. Okay, so you weren't name dropping. <laughs> No, not today, but I, I'm reminded, if, 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 if the committee will indulge me, of the Bishop of Lincoln called Simon Phipps, who was apparently a, a great friend of Princess Margaret, and, and, and he, he, he stood up in the pulpit at, at Lincoln Cathedral and said, on one morning and said, the Queen and I both agree we can't stand name numbers. Yeah. Okay, so that's five, I think, yes. There are uh, one, two, three, four recommendations. Can we agree those? So that, that we do uh, alert the cabinet to the fact there might actually be a complete change of policy. Well, I, sorry, that's, I'm happy to discuss that at the, at the next pre-meeting just to clear the air on this because I don't want to be going over this over and over again. So, so that's what I'm saying. What, what, what's supposed to come to this committee? What's supposed to go anywhere else? And if there has been a change in the in in, in the rationale even of how we're dealing with it, it's okay. We're on to six, which is a data security breach report. Michael? Yes, Chairman, this is my report. I report regularly to this committee as part of my role as senior information risk owner in relation to uh, data protection. Uh, it sets out the breaches which have occurred um, most recently and the actions which we've taken in respect of those particular breaches. Uh, we are now in a different regime where we have to report any breach um, we have to assess the breach and decide whether or not to report it within 72 hours of a breach occurring, <coughs> hence the details in the report. You will notice that there were only two matters which were decided uh, f applying the criteria which we have adopted were worthy of reporting to the Information Commissioner. Uh, one of those, the Information Commissioner decided no further action was required, uh, and the other matter which reported on the 10th of October, we are awaiting a response from the Information Commissioner. The general, uh, general, I suppose, theme which we can see from the breaches which occur, uh, and we try to learn and make changes to our procedures as a result of each and every single one of these, is that most occur because of human error mistakes, innocent mistakes which people make. Um, that is very difficult to overcome, but we will continue to try, and we do remind all staff of their obligations under the data protection regulations and all staff undertake training whenever they start their work with the council and it's refreshed on an annual basis to ensure that they are aware of their obligations and the council's li potential liabilities as well. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, just the, I mean, it, uh, they are... Yeah, I know there are breaches, but some of them are, 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 are human errors, aren't they? That's mainly what it is, rather than, than deliberately doing something. But the only point I had was in the um, the copying letter, families and children report a service. The post office put it, the, the post person put it in the wrong address. Have we gone back to the post office to say, uh, or or is this a one-off? Do we t do we report back to whoever delivering our mail that they give it to the wrong address, Michael? We would in all of those. Uh, that was the, uh, I think it's on, page, oh, sorry, the pages, my pages aren't numbered, but. It's, it's DB 2018 46. 46, yeah. Cover letter and confidential children's families report posted to a service user but delivered to the incorrect address by Royal Mail. We'll raise each and every one of these concerns with Royal Mail. I mean, again, it's our, it's our responsibility to deal with that when it arises, and we would hope that Royal Mail will in turn remind their staff to make sure they put the letters through the right door. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Anyway, any any questions, any points, members? Um, yeah, it, it, it was just really a question. When it is identified that there is an issue, that where, where there are several issues within a, one de department, you, you mentioned earlier that there is um, training. But what do you do when there is a number of issues that are being identified within a de given department? Yeah, uh, right, right, but. There are several things which we do on a sort of macro level across the organisation. We have an information governance board which meets about every six to eight weeks, which I meet with uh, 
people from each of the services across the council and we share all of the problems which have arisen and we decide whether or not there's any corporate advice or direction which needs to be given. Is there any change to systems and procedures which we need to bring in? Very simple suggestions around those sorts of various things which led to us encrypting all of our council laptops and ensuring in the past that all memory sticks were encrypted, giving advice to staff. And this might seem a very simple thing, and it is a very simple thing, but they should keep paper records and computers in separate bags. Because the reality is people are most unlikely to ever steal paper, but much more likely to steal a laptop. And if the two are kept together, the unencrypted, the soft copy, the paper version, is at risk. But we find that's never stolen. Also, if people are, are, are likely to leave it behind on a train or, or wherever else, then you know it's possible to, uh, to recover more likely in the not you'll recover the paper, but you won't recover the computer. The computer is a loss to the council, of course, because they cost a thousand pounds each. But there's not a risk because you can't access the information. So, at the macro level, that's what we do within the individual services. If we find that there is a common problem, I will give directions through our Freedom of Information Data Protection team as to what we expect to happen, and we will follow up and we will make sure that that has happened. If it gets down to an individual person who we find has, on a number of occasions, done something silly, uh, which amounts to them being quite careless in the way in which they're dealing with their work, and that's exceptionally unusual to happen, then, to be honest, then disciplinary proceedings of whatever form will follow with the staff member. And to take the extreme example, which happens very, very rarely, with, them, with bearing in mind we have 4,000 staff where there is something deliberate, then there will be disciplinary action taken against the member staff. And the uh, instructions which I have given as the Council's monitoring officer and solicitor is that on each and every occasion when if there is any indication that any breach has been deliberate, we must consider all sanctions against the employee up to and including dismissal. That's, I think, a message which is very well understood across the Council. Obviously, that may not result because even if it was deliberate, sometimes it can be extenuating circumstances. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you for that. Okay, can we, can we, the recommendation is that we note the report. Is that okay? Thank you. Item 7 is uh, compliance with the Gifts and Hospitality Protocol. Do you want to introduce it, Michael? Uh, yes, happy to answer any questions which there may be. Um, officers still have to record, which they uh, diligently do, as far as we can be aware. Uh, gifts, that's set out in page 50, paragraph B, and hospitality, which they received. These levels have been increased in recent years. There have been suggestions that the hospitality level could be increased further. Sometimes, I will agree, um, because it comes to me, exceptions to the hospitality provision if it's an appropriate form of hospitality which has been given. For instance, um, professionals attending uh, dinners or presentation evenings with uh, other professionals. We have had a situation to determine where um, council officers have been uh, offered um, I was going to say rewards, awards, uh, and the hospitality which was being offered exceeded our limit. It would have been perverse if they couldn't have gone to the meeting to receive their award, therefore we've agreed that as exceptions to it. But um, the details are there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's good to see that uh, staff continue to um, deal with this in a, in a very diligent way. Uh, the record is and remains publicly available if people wish to look at it, but to be honest, there is very little of interest in in the uh, gifts and hospitality received. Of course, members no longer have to record any gift or hospitality they receive. The law has changed in relation to them since 2011. I didn't know that. I don't get any anyway, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> well, what you'll see from the record is there's little which is, which is given. Um, Officers, officers know, and uh, I mean, it sometimes can cause a little bit of offence for the public, where uh, they want to give a small gift. I'm talking about, you know, a small box of Quality Street, which two pounds fifty or other chocolates are available um, to a member of staff. But uh, we, we, they have to reject. Christmas them. present. <laughs> <laughs> you can get them for one fifty and somewhere else. Where they are. I'll tell you. Mind, thank you, Chairman. That's. Uh, I, I just want to say you're absolutely right, and I do think. I, I have my own particular views on this and I've tried to change it. I don't think it's enough, but I'm not going to propose that today. I just want to make sure that everybody's treated even handedly, that's all. And I do real I do appreciate and I did have a go at the Rand 
didn't wasn't called a director of social services uh, with adults anywhere to say you know that that people do want to give gifts but they have stuck to the five pound that's what they want to do and and yes. you know so we've seen that box of chocolates and the rest are shared around or whatever okay I just want to there's two of them here Michael which just stood out at me which is um, and I know it's probably made, I don't want to particularly this is one where uh, and these are two senior officers uh, had. Uh, there's one, let me go to the first one, which is uh, 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 an annual dinner, a CIHT annual dinner. This is, I don't know what page it is, Michael. This is the second page, sorry, second, no, no, third. Yes. Okay. Uh, the dates, can I give the, the uh, received date, 812 2817. Have you got that, Michael? Right, two from the bottom of, yes. yeah. Um, one of the points made here was that some were rejected because we were either we'd either be using contractors or, or could 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 use contractors. But here we are using a, the colas, for instance, and that was agreed. Now, and it's called essential networking event. And and I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not convinced that um, yeah I, I have no problem with personally, but but I just want to make sure that if somebody lower down the chain was invited to something where we had a contractor, that in fact we wouldn't be saying because it's a contractor you're not getting it. Yeah, you shouldn't do it. And the other one is just that's one point, Michael. One, then, if you've got that one, yes. uh, one, two, three, three down, yes. uh, which is an invitation to a black tie dinner. Uh, page t three, I think it would be. Oh, sorry, it is. No, it's not. Oh, page 57. Sorry. Sorry, it's my fault. I didn't see that. Did you see the first one? I've, I've done the one near, near the bottom. Okay. Okay. And then, and then the, the one where an officer was invited. Um, I couldn't attend, but I just wonder what what the advice what we would have done on that occasion. So it, it, the invitation came in. I've no idea who these people are, um, but but in the end the officer couldn't go, and therefore that seems to have resolved it. What would the would the officer have been allowed to go to this? Does anyone trying to get up, Michael? I, I, I do. The the test which we apply is is it possible that as a consequence of this. It could be any undue influence brought to bear upon the individual officer, and that will very much depend on the circumstances and the relationships. It is important that our senior staff, um, and these are two quite senior people within the organisation, are able to network and meet with other uh, professionals. Therefore, we, we try to encourage that to happen. Um, your point about would we allow this to happen if it was happening further down in the organisation? I can give you a specific example where. Oh, sorry, look at the, look at the one underneath that. Look at the, 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 the one where somebody was invited to Southampton for the day. Look at that. That's a, that's a senior officer. Yeah. The, 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 yes. Well, not as senior as, as the other two. Other but don't go sorry. sorry, I mean, oh, sometimes the. Um, offer of hospitality will be rejected not by the manager of the recipient of the hospitality but by the potential recipient themselves so on that occasion I think the officer decided I'm not comfortable with this and declined it it still gets recorded in the system even if it is declined yeah but what, what had it gone through the system um, what would it, would, it <laughs> would it have been approved it would uh, have been wouldn't it? it it most probably would have been yeah on that occasion um, yeah, we, we don't. What we're concerned about is, first of all, public perception. That's terribly important. Secondly, the possibility that there will be any undue influence. I can give you an extreme example, perhaps, which occurred a few years ago, which is in relation to uh, a highways engineer who was invited to a conference in Vancouver, and the officer return flights, hotel, so forth, he was going to be there for a week and he was asked to speak at a particular conference by the contractor. I agreed to him being, having, enjoying the hospitality, primarily because at the end of the conference he was leaving the council's employment, therefore there was absolutely zero possibility of any undue influence. So each case, and that is an extreme one-off example, and why not, that person was an expert they were inviting him to Canada to speak at this conference about his area of expertise and his relationship with the contractor. There is no harm in that whatsoever. Um, uh, person I'm sure you put some personal well, I, th I think it was it was very nice that we could uh, very nice. Yes, indeed, and it was nice that we could actually do that because you know there are so tremendous restrictions placed upon public employees to make sure that there is no suggestion of undue influence. 
most, uh, Chairman, most of the hospitality never reaches the decision making of the director because the officers, as you can see from the list, normally reject it. Um, and it'll only be very exceptional that they'll say, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to breach the limit here, but as I suggested, an awards dinner, which was in relation to our property team, and it would be perverse if they couldn't have gone to the dinner or had to leave before the dessert came along um, to receive their award. So, yeah, it's it, horses for courses depends on the facts of each in particular case. Yeah, sorry, my, my point was that everybody, as long as all our staff are, are, are treated equally hand, equal yeah, handedly. They, 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 they do, and uh, to be honest, we're, we, I think we have got the approach here where uh, it's more likely to be that people will be cautious and reject a gift to avoid the potential concern arising. Okay, thank you, Hugh. On the specific issue, specific case we have just looked at, uh, Steve Groves, um, the invitees were Steve Groves, Meredith Hughes and Adam Hardwick. Do we know whether Meredith Hughes and Adam Hardwick accepted or not, and should it not be here? It should be there, and I will follow that up and find out why it's not, or if we have made some mistake. Uh, in not publishing it, but I'll find the information that it's a good point. It, it, yeah, a they are all in thirteen. A second, slightly light-hearted point. Um, we look at Tristram Sandmills uh, rejecting a, an invitation uh, from Pie Fillers Fly Fishing and Cat and Law. Uh, do they really exist? <laughs> <laughs> But is it, it is actually interesting that at the bottom of the page, um, though he didn't dis, dis, didn't he didn't do the rejection for Oliver Sheriff. It is Kristen Samuels' directorate yes. where um, Oliver Sheriff was denied the opportunity to network in Southampton, and Tristan had obviously enjoyed some hospitality. No, he didn't go. No, he didn't go. Oh, did he not go? He was not available. No, he did. Him. No, he went to Lansac. He went to Owner. He went to um, oh, yeah. yeah, top. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe. Charity. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Who, whose charity we have to ask? But no. I mean, <laughs> anyway, I. Do I, I notice I, who the approver was? Mm. I wouldn't trust him. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, okay. Any, any other points? No. Uh, happy to, to yeah, yeah. note it's, the report. It's, it's one of these. Thank you. Yeah. So I must say, I'm, I must say, Chairman, I am very pleased to note that Angela Martin d received two gift bags and small bottles of wine and chocolate on the same day. Yes. Or she's either that or she's been double recorded. No, no, they're, they're recorded in different places. Oh, it's in the same place? Same place. All right. OK, can we move on to item 8, which is consideration of political balance rules in relation yeah. to the constitution of subcommittees considering complaints against members. Uh, this is a chestnut we get every year in order to say we don't have to be politically representative or whatever it is, yeah, I forgot the word, yeah, a political balance. Um, any comments on this? Michael, did you want to introduce it? Um, if anybody objects, we can't do it. Um, so I no strongly recommend that you don't object. One person. Okay, thank you very much, members. So we accept the recommendation. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 9, then, is the proposed change to Constitution Part 3, Rules of Procedure, Policy and Review Panels, Overview, overview and scrutiny procedure rules. Um, there are various recommendations there. It's, no, it's a recommendation lead in, in relation to the, the lead in the lead call in member not being allowed to vote on the item if, if they're a member of the management panel. That's scrutiny management, presumably. Isn't yes, it? Chairman. It, 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 this is a, a technical point, but one which I think, from point of view of open, openness and transparency, is important that we should address. Um, if a councillor calls a matter, a, ca a cabinet decision, into scrutiny management panel for reconsideration, as has happened recently with regard to Vessel, um, and the lead call-in member, that's the person who's presenting it to the panel, actually sits on the panel as well, then it would be possible under the law, as long as they believe that they have not come to a concluded view, which might be hard to accept, for them to be able to participate in the, consider in the consideration of that call in which they have not just presented to the uh, the panel. My suggested amendment is that we should prohibit that happening just so that there is a clear uh, transparency and openness in our decision making so that all members don't feel, <laughs> and I don't think they ever would, but shouldn't feel tempted to sit on a panel when they're presenting to it as well. I think it makes sense. 
just to co- it has happened in the past. This is going to happen. It's going to happen. Or was going to happen yeah, it's on Friday, but yeah. not next Friday. It, is, it, has, it has never happened. It has happened that the lead member may be able to sit on the panel, but it has never happened that they do yeah, sit on the panel. Yeah. yeah. We have the advice which I give is that you really shouldn't so, sit on the panel, although the law does allow it. Therefore, I think we need to change our rules to, to what safeguard. Does law, what does the law say? The law says as long as they believe that they have still got an open mind on the matter, they can sit on the panel. That's very hard to believe if you're the lead call-in member. I would suggest from the point of view of the man in the club and omnibus. Ian, OK. Sorry, my, my problem with this is, I, 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 looking at, if you look at it from a parliamentary point of view, people refer uh, matters to a, their own committee, like Bernard Jenkin will do that for various things, and people do, I mean, and, and, and the question is, why are they not entitled to an opinion? Uh, I, I don't, it, what, it, what it does for me is restricts further the back bench part of the council where, um, where if, if, if somebody who, uh, in Council Bosher's case, this is about Council Bosher specifically because it's, it's, it's given rise to this issue, he has instituted a call in about parking, about which he knows a great deal, having been the cabinet member in, uh, responsible for it up until May, uh, and he's also on the scrutiny management panel, so he's not chairing it or anything, he's a, he's, he's, he's a member of it, um, but, but he is leading the call-in of a decision that he thinks that the panel needs to consider. I don't think that it's going to have changed his opinion, whether he sits on it or not, and I don't think it's going to change anyone else's opinion. I mean, what, 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 I, what I would ask is why would somebody who has an opinion not be able to sit on a committee that where well, they know what they're talking about. I mean, I, 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 you, you might think it's a matter of fair play, but, but. Oh. Well, okay. Sorry, could I, could, could I say? I mean, it's 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 not enshrined in law. It's it's a genuine attempt to make things look fair. I'm going to withdraw this item. Opposing any change. Can we move on to item 10 then, which is revision to the statutory appointment section in the Constitution? Um, I want to introduce a couple of questions which I meant to ask. Could I do that first? But once you've, if there's anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, we have a number of statutory officer appointments. Um, you have delegated lots of minor changes to the Constitution to me, which deal with topographical errors and deals with changes in structure, which is on the officer's side of the fence. But what we have discovered is that um, we do need to make a change to the Constitution to give specific authority to the Chief Executive to be able to declare a vacancy in office and give public notice of a casual vacancy. Um, and that's something, it's a decision which isn't actually uh, delegated to me, and that it's just this is a procedural point, yeah, really. Again, yes, that's right. Sorry, it's, sorry. The, the, no, the decision, the, the ability to be able to make the change isn't delegated to me. You you have delegated changes to me around matters of structure, but this particular proper <laughs> officer appointment, this is what the law refers to the as these the as these decisions have to be made by. Uh, actually, it has to then go on to council for council approval. It's a very minor technical point. It's just something which we need. recent review of the constitution. What, what has committed. gone to council approval? This, this has. This what the, this item. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm in favour of it. I can't see Well, it I want to ask you a couple of questions, that's all. And I think maybe the because this this came to me a bit late, but I just just the the the, the, the over over leaf ones Mike on page 72. A is fine. B becomes disqualified from a member of the authority otherwise than under section 79 of the local government act 2000, section 30. I, I, I think if it's going to council, it should be spelled out what that provision says. Yeah. Okay, yeah. members? And the other one is C. Cease to be a member of the authority by failure, by reason of failure to attend meetings of the authority. Uh, is there an amount of meetings? Yes. Uh, Chairman, uh, all councillors must attend a council, a meeting of the council within a period of six months. six months. So that means not just a council meeting, but any other meeting, planning committee meeting or whatever else. You fail to do so as a matter of law, 
you're disqualified and you cease to be a member of the council and then your seat must be put up for re-election. Could we say the six months? Could we give that? Could we I'll, I'll expand uh, uh, on that and give explanation and I okay. think in the nature of the council agenda that's an important one. I was, I was always the, under the impression that an apology counted as not, been, not, not in attendance but, but qualified within the six month period an apology only but clearly that's not correct. If, uh, and it happens very rarely, I think there was one Councillor Bateman um, some years ago, Lady Councillor, who wasn't able to attend for a period of six months. And what she did in those circumstances, I think she'd moved to Scotland, as I recall, she asked for uh, extended leave of absence. So that's the way you overcome it. The Councillor has to ask the Chief Executive Producer's report and a member has to then move the recommendation in Council. Okay, Member. So, so uh, any questions on this? I recall a lot period when um, a former councillor for Charles Dickens Ward was ex was oh, absent through illness for a very long period of time. In case of illness, could this be? A, uh, does the six months still apply? It, it applies on all occasions. You always have to have a resolution of council. And it's an interesting resolution as well because it only needs to be proposed, it doesn't need to be seconded. So. I've now lost the plot. Um, <coughs> it, what needs to be a resolution of council? <laughs> the, the, um, this has to go through, but the extension of leave of absence beyond six months, that you have to be given special dispensation by the council. To be able so, to so the council as a whole yes. would overrule and override this provision because it can. That's but, what the law lies. But in, in, in the event that no such motion was put to council, and or it was and it didn't succeed, then the, it reverts back to the chief executive's decision that he applies the law. As chief, it's yeah, chief executive has no choice. The person has ceased to be a councillor once six months. Has expired. The chief executive is often the, the deputy returning officer anyway. So, yep. Um, and a by-election would be called. Yeah. And and is it is it is calculated in actual days? Then is that saying within sort of exactly yes. six months from the all last days from when they last attended, excluding the day in which they did uh, attend. And, and, and presumably. It's unlikely to be the case, but it would obviously, if there were no council meeting for six months, then everyone would be no longer be a councillor. That's what you're saying. That's the best way to get rid of the whole council. Is, is to, is to, you'd have to cancel all meetings meeting. for the next yeah. six months. Yeah, there has to be full council. So. Just, re just rehearsing the point which we said before, you have to attend any meeting, so a councillor could attend a planning committee meeting, scrutiny management panel meeting, but the resolution must be passed by full council, so yes, if we, um, we do keep a BDI out for this, I mean it happens very, very exceptionally, we've had a couple of instances in the last year where people have come close to this, and we do remind the councillor, and if they're within a group we will remind the group leader as well to make sure, because it, it would be very unfortunate somebody had been elected and then because of illness they were disqualified from office. Is that okay then? So, so was it? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is agreed then, with the, this proposal, which will go, as you said, to full council. And just if, if, if just an appendix or something, what, yeah. section 79 or whatever it is, okay, and, 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 and the time period. Thank you. Members, we're on to is this the one with the? Um, uh, so we've got. I've got. I've got to ask members whether on the on the orange sheets that we've got the the that we move into uh, exclusion of the press and public. However, we do have quite a bit on the white sheets. So if members are happy to keep uh, confine themselves to the white sheet bit, uh, and 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 if there's any questions on the on the. Uh, I, can I just put, take this off? I, 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 I don't see what in appendix one. Um, uh, is should be exempt. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a statement of fact that there have been waivers that have been applied for and, and found. Um, they don't comply with normal procurement, but I don't think it's anything that actually in any way um, prejudices the supplier or the, or the council or anything. It's simply saying that the, the means by which it happened was irregular for all sorts of different reasons. And I don't see that it should be exempt. I, I, where we're talking about performance, 
in Appendix 4. I do accept that there is a good reason why that should be exempt. Um, and I'm, I, I, I don't know why exempt, Appendix 5 is exempt unless, unless minutes of the Strategic Contract Management Board meeting do not actually get published. Uh, they, they, oh, could I just say, it's nice of you to challenge this now, Ian. This is the way we got this. These are formed the same way as we had when you were the chair of here. No, I, I challenged them then. I did. <laughs> yeah. I challenged well, them then. I, I just, no, I don't, well, I, did. I, I don't recall, but, but um, no, I, I just well, like, uh, uh, somebody's going to explain why their Appendix 1 is exempt and, and Appendix 5 is exempt. Yeah. Chairman, I, I, I'm not going to be completely helpful. On um, Appendix 5, those aren't published uh, those, those minutes are for internal okay, consumption well, only. In that case, that's, I understand that. Appendix 1, I'm happy to work to review those and to make them public, but I don't particularly want to do it on the hoof at the moment. I'd like to read through those in some detail and give an undertaking to members that I'll produce uh, um, an open version of those as far as I'm able. Well, well, I just make a recommendation that, before we exempt things in future, that you do precisely that and decide whether, in your opinion, yeah. um, they... And, and with a presumption that they should be made public rather than they should be made exempt. That, that's a presumption based on which we work. The reason I'm saying that I want some time to review it is one of my colleagues will have, will have dealt with this. I'm sure they've come to a good conclusion. I'd like to understand what that is. I don't review all of the papers which come before the Council. Can I say, and it's, 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 it's a fair point. Oh, sorry, it's a, it's a fair point, Mr. Lett. So no, they're still exempt. So we're going to have a look at it. So I don't need an explanation. That's what you're going to do, okay? Uh, and, and, and we look, and if these, these were then, could then be attached to the minutes, presumably, yes. if we decide they're not exempt. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, please. Thank you, Chair. This is uh, the... Sorry, my name is David Mormon. I'm a Senior Procurement Professional. I work for Finance and Information Directorate. Uh, this is your quarterly report on um, procurement management information um, and contains now eight sections and five appendices. Um, that's expanded a little since the last time at the request of the committee. Um, what I normally do is take you through um, the highlights of each section, if that's okay. Um, for section one is, is the sort of the headline figure for the monitoring month. Uh, this time it was July uh, 2018. I'm uh, happy to report that uh, the percentage compliance with the con contract procedural rules is 97%. That's it. When you say July, is it up to, is it April to July, or is it, or is it uh, April, May, June, or is it July, August, September? It's not one month, surely. It is one month. This, this, um, we, we, we meet three, on a three-monthly basis, and we do things by quarter, so why are we dealing with just one month? Well, um, I understand it's because, the, the, for the most part, this report covers the second quarter, July, August, September and it covers the whole of that quarter but for this the, the committee's uh, instructed us to report on any one month because the, the amount of effort and work required to report these figures uh, was considered by the committee to be uh, unnecessary that's i've inherited this report uh, this is how it is but i'm happy to, to take instructions so uh, the headline thing is we've exceeded targets of 95 percent uh, moving on to section two this now concerns the whole of second quarter, three months, uh, and reports on the number of waivers uh, awarded uh, by the council uh, for contracts over five thousand pounds during the uh, during that quarter. During the quarter, uh, and waivers uh, actually made up thirty-eight percent of all contracts awarded in the second quarter, uh, representing fifteen percent of the contract value in that quarter. This is broadly in line with previous um, previous reports. Uh, and actually informal benchmarking suggests that uh, wider public sector figures for this uh, would be more like 60-40 instead of 40-60 as we're reporting here. So roughly speaking we are reporting that 40% of our contracts are awarded on the back of a waiver. My advice to the committee is that uh, informally, uh, and um, there is work... Irregularly is, is the best way to describe it. Irregularly, as in they're not. <coughs> the regular thing is to have proper procurement conformance, isn't it? That is, that is a regular way of doing it. I think a, a waiver is another regular way of doing it. The it's it's irregular, i.e. it's not something not that, we, that, that we don't say, go and get a waiver instead of doing this. We say we prefer people to get to go through the proper procurement, which would be the regular procedure. So anything that isn't is irregular. I'm and happy to I, accept that, yes, you. absolutely. Uh, moving on. 
do this following page gives the committee just more detail on those 51 waivers uh, that were mentioned in the previous table. Um, yet more detail is available in Appendix 2, which is not exempt. I don't normally go into too much detail here unless members have questions. I do have a number of questions on... Um, Sorry, what, is it OK? You, I think you should, if you finish the report, otherwise we'll be jumping all over the place. No, I thought you said that you had questions. He did, yeah, but I'm chairing it. Sorry. Yeah. OK, could you finish the report now? Happy to. Thank you, Chair. Um, moving on then to uh, Section 3. We're moving now from considering waivers that have been awarded for new contracts in the second quarter of 2018-19 rather, to spend in that quarter, this is page 80, uh, with so spend in that quarter with contracts with waivers associated with them, regardless of when they are awarded. So if a contract was awarded with a waiver before the second quarter, this is the spend against those contracts. Uh, over the page, um, and across the committee, we introduced uh, a view of that by directorate uh, and splitting out between high value contracts and medium value contracts. Uh, and you can see that that explains that if adult services and public health, the amount of their money they spend with contracts associated with waivers generally tends to be the high value contracts, uh, and the rest are generally medium value contracts. Again, over the page to section four. Uh, section 4 combines the previous two parts to give a, uh, a view by directorate of the spend by contract size and waiver. And so you can see which um, directorates uh, are spending with waiver and which size of contracts they are spending with. Section 5 is a new section that um, the committee asked us to put in for this uh, report. This gives a, a slightly more detailed view of the Council's top 20 suppliers. Um, it provides detail on who, which directorates are spending with those suppliers, how much those directorates are spending, uh, under what contracts they're spending the, 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 uh, with those suppliers. Yeah, you will certainly found Mount Joy in there. Nearly there. Moving on to section six, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. This essentially gives more detail in the same manner, but greater scope, less detail by directorate on, on who the council's top suppliers are. Section 7 concerns now moving from looking at spend to looking at contract performance. Um, you the members will see that actually the number of contracts is, is now rising, having been declining a couple of years ago. Um, you will also see that the number of contracts that have never had their key performance indicators reported continues to rise. Um, we are working with uh, directorates to ensure that they are aware of these contracts and asking them to ensure that they are addressed. On that matter, the final two tables concern contracts which by directorate have never had a KPI score and the final one is they've not had it in the last 12 months, although we do have scores from earlier than that. Um, confirm that uh, we've approached the, the um, Director for Culture, Director for Housing and Director of Regeneration, which are the three largest ones, provided them with the information about their contracts and the officers who were expected to report KPIs uh, and continue to work with those directors. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Ian, I know. I, I, I apologise for being so precipitous. I was, I was thinking we might even finish the meeting before one o'clock, if we're lucky. <coughs> um, can I go to the, uh, the appendix in here, which is page 85? for me. Um, so if I can just get my head back. The lifetime contract value, as I understand at the very end, is what we expect that contract to be. And then the value of spend in Q2 is what actually happened in three months. So we would expect at any stage what is in the first column, the last column, the lifetime contract value, to be somewhat higher or at least the same as <laughs> what's in column the value of spend in QGC. Yeah. I get Knights Brown Construction Limited at the bottom of page 85, looking at it sideways, and I see we've paid 3,245,992 3, to this worthy institution, clearly, but the lifetime contract value is 2,490,190. And I'm going to go, I'm afraid there are more. I mean, this is not the only one. 
it, the, it just doesn't make okay, sense okay, in a procurement. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yes, there are two on page 18. Yep. The Society of St. James, <coughs> Public Health, Substance Misuse and Mental Health, Dual Diagnosis Supported Living Service, value spent in Q2 is 988,586, but the lifetime contract value is 500,059. Actually, only one. Mm. But whoever is in charge of HR Legal Audit and Performance and Commensurate Limited has done a really good job by putting together, a, obviously, a very carefully calculated lifetime contract value of a very unround figure of £10 million, assuming that um, anything will fit in with that, to produce 939,227 in one month. So I'm... Uh, one quarter. One, one quarter. One Q2. quarter. Q2, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued that it's a very large contract value, and I wonder whether that's just sort of to pad up the top so they don't come here and have to explain it. Uh, then Balfour Beatty Group, page 90, top, um, have done some seriously early pre-construction services on South Sea Coastal Defence because they've managed to spend 772808 of an £85,543 contract. Strikes me that there's a, a disconnect between what we think is going on or should be going on within the procurement sphere and what other people think that they can spend the council's money on without necessarily yeah. having got permission to do so. <coughs> I don't know whether that's correct or whether I've interpreted that. Uh, and this idea of making lots of sort of headroom for other contracts where actually that means to me they haven't been carefully worked out. They just said, oh, put a figure down so that we'll get, we'll get it through. Which means to me that they're not actually controlling the contracts properly. Uh, the, can I just explain where the sources of these come from? The lifetime contract value, which is the right-hand column, comes from, in in all of these cases, will be the European Journal, uh, uh, um, the OG value, which we publish at the time of award of the contract. So that, the official journal of the European Union. The official journal of the European Union. So in procurement, above certain thresholds, <laughs> we're, we're required to uh, advertise and, uh, uh, but not only the opportunity, but also the award of contracts uh, uh, across Europe. This is the value that we will publish when we award a contract, and that's what's published on our contracts register. Now, that may all may not always be the actual value of the contract uh, over the life of the contract. Things change. So what I'm not able to do is to explain these in detail, but other than to say that for the first example you gave, um, where a capital scheme was valued at 2.49 million, this is Knights Brown construction. A lifetime contract? means you'd expect it to be more than a quarter, and it's just completely overspent in that quarter. I mean, it's just it's completely overspent the lifetime of it. And I, much as I applaud the idea that, they, that the EU has got some, some um, handle on this, uh, or some means of doing it, it isn't the be all end all. There must be a reason for the amounts that have been given as the, an indicative amount of the total of the contract. To think that we spent, I can't get back to where, um, you know, the, 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 where have I found it, the first one. Oh, yes, the bottom. In, t in three months, 3,245,992 on North Port Sea Island CFERM scheme, which I'm assuming has had, if it's got the kind of planning that schools have around here, has had months of planning to find that the lifetime contract value is two and a half million and therefore at least three quarters of a million less than the than what was what was called upon on that in that quarter is amazing to me. Chairman, I, I, I don't believe these are overspends, but <laughs> I'm quite confident they're not. I think we just need to provide that explanation, because I appreciate what you're saying. On the face of it, it appears very odd, but I think there is a good explanation for it. We'll find it. Chairman, I'd be very happy with that, but I'd also like to know what the policy is about ramping up lifetime contract values in order to p create headroom that we don't know anything about. Because it seems to me that I'm a, a greatly in favour of reducing headroom as much as possible, so they have to justify any changes to contract values. If we just say, OK, we'll put 10 million down and see what happens, then we are not. We're, we're just giving them, it's, it's, we're giving, we're giving them a carte blanche to go and spend as much as, as that. So I, 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 it's, it's, it's taxpayers' money, and we need to be careful with that. Okay, yeah, we've got an explanation. Thank you. Hugh? 
Just a comment. It would seem to me, looking at some of those which we have um, bit concerns about, Knights Brown Construction Limited, um, they are their expenditure, their value of their spend. Would that it be solely from uh, contracts with Portsmouth City Council, or would this be on the wider contract which they have with the employ uh, the um, Environment Agency for that? And if it is, I think we ought to be informed of, of that. So, again, yeah, I look forward to a report. Okay, we'll, we'll report back now. Anybody, any other points? Uh, yes, Chairman. Yeah. Before my co he jumps in. Going back to page 78, um, we have reason for waiver not obtaining three bids. Are these cases where they should have obtained three bids and did not? And I think in that case, um, what were the reasons um, or excuses for not obtaining those three bids? Uh, in these cases, the, the, the um, directors went out, offered the opportunity widely, um, were hoping for more than three bids, but in the end, fewer than three bids uh, were received. So it's not like we only invited to, to bid. It is not our... We are not at fault over this. It is merely that um, they haven't expressed it wide enough for the market to come in with three bids, yeah? I would suggest that the market was insufficiently interested to bid. Uh, okay. Right, it can be that, but, I, but this is where actually I, I'd like clarity, because um, when Chris Ward asked Dane Javier at this meeting, I, I asked him exactly the same question, and he said, well, if Oracle, I don't know how much one would curse the name, um, said that they wanted to, that, that, that they had a, an API or something they were going to attach, uh, then they were the only people who could do, so you couldn't go out and get three bids to do, the, to do that. So there are, there are some times when it's specific, and I think what I then asked at the time was whether it could be made clear to us when making these, giving us these um, statistics, where we think not obtaining three bids because inappropriate, or not attaining three bids because the, they didn't actually materialise would be a useful way of looking at this rather than um, rather than dealing with it in the, sort of in the round. Okay, I, I do review all the waivers that uh, we report and I'm happy to report that in those six instances they were uh, the example that we discussed previously. In the example of Oracle, that would be recorded as a direct award. That a direct award has no uh, that four million one hundred twenty three thousand and two pounds has nobody else coming in and saying we can provide that service. Obviously not Oracle, but we didn't we didn't pay Oracle four million pounds in the last. <coughs> Please, Michael, don't tell me we spent four million pounds on Oracle in the last three months. <laughs> That'd be just too too much. Um, but forty contracts average out at a hundred thousand each. Yeah, that's correct. My understanding is that, um, uh, and that's the threshold at which directors can direct a board without any further recourse. Um, uh, there are details in appendix two as to what they are. So if you follow um, the reason for waiver column down uh, near at the end of the right of appendix two, you can uh, review what and uh, whether for and how much. Well, where we go into. Is that okay on the white paper bit of this report? Yep. Is that okay? Thank you. Uh, well, I've got it now, as we said earlier on, to exclude the press and public, please. That goes off as well. Uh, and I know Neil's got to go in a couple of minutes, so thank you, Neil. I know